Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, also, good morning to those over in the, the, the fellowship hall, the hub space that are worshiping with us at the other end of the building. If you're a guest or visitor, we're glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, we do have some people who worship on the other side just to help us create a little space and uh, have, have room to, to wiggle a little bit, but glad that you're here this morning. Uh, that, that last song that we sang really would be a, a good song to get to the heart of this message and uh, series that, that we're starting here. Uh, calling live, living loved. Um, so that's the idea that, that when God satisfies us, we're able to love sacrificially the way uh, that Jesus has modeled for us. Um, I did, I did want to do a little housekeeping, a couple announcements, uh, just going at a little deeper level than, than what Jason did this morning. Um, one is uh, just a reminder that our parking lot, uh, this is kind of family talk for those who are, are a part of Faith Alliance Church. If you're visiting with us, this doesn't uh, pertain as directly to you, but just with the parking lot, uh, I've heard a lot of great feedback. It's given us a little a room to move out there as well, um, but just a reminder that, that we did make a decision to take a, a loan locally that has a high interest rate. So we're adding about $12 a day to that, just an in interest. Um, and, and our hope and prayers that we can step forward as a church family and really knock that out. I think the loan right now is at about $46,000 still. Uh, so just invite you to pray on that and, and just raise an awareness to it. Reminder of the situation there with the, the parking lot. If you have any questions on that, feel free to, to contact the church. Um, I know some people look to the end of the year uh, but just know that, that that situation right now that we're facing as a church family. Um, and that's also an anticipation of the For the Kingdom initiative that we've started in November. Uh, For the Kingdom is meant to be a time where we can look beyond ourselves and beyond the walls of this church to sacrificially uh, pray fast and support people um, just in, in hard places. And we'd love to be able to do that, but we want to do it responsibly from a, a financial perspective and stewardship and uh, leadership and modeling uh, how to handle those things. So just uh, raising that to your awareness as, uh, again, that's for our, our church family, uh, the commitment that we made with that. Um, also, there are, there's a big vote coming up November 7th that pertains to the issue of life um, and specifically uh, would impact uh, some of the legislation that has to do with abortion. So there are some flyers in the foyer. Uh, encourage you to grab one of those. I believe Bob and Sharon Hibner, uh, they have a good connections with some resources and different organizations. They'll be out there passing out uh, flyers for that. And if you have any questions, they'd be great people to ask. Uh, you can always come to our staff as well. Uh, but we just want to be a, a church that is known to stand for life. Um, and, and it points out some of the things that are... Uh, maybe intentionally a little vague in the wording, um, and also just raises awareness to that. So uh, important for us to go out uh, on the November 7th and cast our vote. Uh, I wanted to read from Psalm, I think Psalm 139 is a great Psalm just to keep in your back pocket as you think about that issue. Um, this is a, a Psalm that, that many of you will recognize. Psalm 139 it starts in verse 13. It says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. So you see that process of God knitting us together in the womb, um, which as soon as a person puts their hands to the process of knitting, the work has begun, right? So God has knitted us together in our mother's womb. Verse 14, I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That knitting project is what it's talking about. Uh, wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So looking forward to the anticipation of a life that uh, God had ordained from the beginning of time, 
Um, and I, I think we could even illustrate this in, in fully recognizing uh, people's experience and interaction with the issue of abortion. Abortion is pretty broad. I uh, would invite anyone who's been through an abortion or knows somebody uh, and you're close to who's been through an abortion to, to come forward and share that story. Uh, I think we, we would greatly benefit from having people share their story of redemption. redemption. Uh, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Uh, to know that, that God forgives and restores and renews, and it's a, a powerful testimony. And I know a lot of times those voices are silenced or there's shame heaped on them. Uh, so we just want you to know this is meant to be a, a safe space of grace uh, and God's restoration. And, and those testimonies and stories have powerful uh, ability to impact people. Um, but I think if, if we think of that issue kind of sliding into the, the topic for today, this idea of living loved, uh, it's, it illustrates, it's illustrated by that issue. You know, the, the world, uh, as I was processing this this week, the idea of living loved, uh, you know, in Scripture, it says that uh, the world will know we're disciples of Jesus by the way we love each other. All right, so the idea is there's this unique set of love that Christians have, that our love is different than the love of the world, All right? So uh, you think uh, of the idea of whether or not someone has a baby, and uh, the, the world kind of draws a line, a boundary line for where love, the extent of love Right? And, and you get up to that extent of love, and then it's like, all right, let's pump the brakes here, because to go beyond that would be stepping into foolishness, or it's requiring a sacrifice that isn't reasonable for you to make. Like, you have a right to stay back and preserve your sense of uh, self and, and your goals. You don't need to go into something that's going to interfere with what you have established. But then Jesus comes... And it, it's in, in Matthew uh, chapter 5 where, where he starts, we looked at this last week, where he starts totally redefining what love is. So he takes the boundary line of love, the extent of love that the world would say to live, and he just blows it out of the water and brings the boundary lines for love way over here. So he creates a new possibility for the extent to which we can really should love. And also, it's not just possibility, but it's expectation that we would love to an extent that the world doesn't understand. They're way back here saying, why would you give up all of that to live out here? And this is what we're talking about. Nobody would live out here unless there's something inside of them that's building that sense of affirmation and love and strength and perseverance. And the only thing that sustains that, spiritually speaking, is the Spirit of God. And we're invited to live where Jesus was living, which is totally different than the world that's saying, you draw that line here. You don't have to go into that inconvenience. You only got so many days to live. You only got so many years to live. You don't, need, you don't need to go out there. Just back it off. But Jesus takes us way out there, this radical idea of love. Uh, you know, Acts chapter 2 talks about it. Uh, the church was blowing up. And, and it says uh, one of the primary reasons was because of the way in which the church was loving each other. Like the church was unique in its expression of love. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks back when I was in sabbat on my sabbatical, I was reading about the early church and the spread of the early church. And they said uh, one of the most significant things that led to the spread of the church in its infancy was the radical love of Christians who whenever an epidemic broke out, which was happening all the time, right? Because they didn't have antibiotics and all of that stuff. Uh, there, an epidemic would break out. Everybody would flee, hunker down and find safety, right? COVID illustrates this. You go get safe, protect yourself. But at that time, the Christian people were stepping into it and they were caring for people who were contagious, but were going to die because they wanted them to have a death with dignity and to be loved and cared for. And this radical love that was almost reckless by a world standard, they were loving way out here and the rest of the world saying, hey, you could die out there. And they're saying, we have a different cause. It's a totally different love. 
that Jesus has, has brought and introduced. So my proposal through this series, uh, the idea of living loved in the month of October, we'll be talking about this, but uh, I, I wrote it down this way. Your ability to truly experience the presence of God and the advancement to participate in the advancement of the gospel depends on our willingness to love the way Jesus loves us. Your ability to experience the presence of God depends on our willingness to go out there. And if we just live here and talk about a Savior who lived out there that we loved and we do love, that's where the idea of hypocrisy comes in because we're living here, but we're saying the ideal is out there. And we don't really experience God's presence. We don't until we shed all of this off and we go live out there and you don't have all the things of this world to fill you. So you got to be out there with Jesus. And that's where his, you're going to start to experience uh, the fullness of, of who God is. Uh, but the problem is the, the world has drawn this line way short. Uh, the, the boundary lines are, are short. So uh, I'm inviting us today, this week, just to prayerfully consider uh, where are we living and, and I've been thinking about this, the idea of living loved is a, a phrase that I've been processing for a long time. And if I'm honest, even this week, uh, God convicts me in the areas where uh, the world's line is right here and I'm doing this. Like, I don't, uh, that's hard. Like all the way, maybe just one foot in, one foot out. Like, can't we win in the world and win with God? Do I really have to give up all of that? And, and I'll just share, you know, in the upcoming weeks, I'll be able to share some of those examples probably, but um, it's challenging, but it's healthy. And uh, I know he's been working on me. I hope he, he works on us corporately uh, as a church. When it's rightly understood, uh, the concept of it impacts every bit of life. It's not about doing, it's about who we are as a people. Uh, so, so I want to pray for us as we uh, open up this series and step into 1 John chapter 4 is where we'll be. If you want to follow along, 1 John chapter 4, I'll get myself there. Uh, we'll look at uh, 7 through 21 today. First John 4, 7 through 21. Let me pray for us. Father God, uh, we come before you this morning, and I'm, I'm just thankful for this space, Lord, that where we can get together and gather as a, a people who are united under the name of Jesus. And Lord, I know that uh, we have people here this morning from uh, just all different walks of life, uh, having been through all different sorts of experiences, uh, living in different realities right now of uh, just facing different battles or uh, maybe uh, having a week that went really well and, and they're just uh, on the mountaintops. And uh, God, we thank you that, that you are a God um, who is worshiped in spirit and in truth and that we can meet you anytime in any place. Uh, and Father God, I pray today that um, as we lean into this series, this idea of being uh, loved by you, that we would live in such a way uh, that expresses the reality that we have uh, your spirit living inside of, inside of us to, to satisfy us. Uh, God, that we would be able to release uh, the things of this world and that we would see the pattern established by Jesus, uh, who could have been the, the ruler of nations, and his wisdom and his knowledge, uh, his ability, uh, God, he, he, could have, he could have had it all by the world's standards. Uh, but he set it all aside and became nothing. Uh, he, he gave up all the world uh, so that we might live. And I pray that you just give us eyes to see uh, that spiritual reality that in our dying to the world, uh, we give opportunity of life to those around us. Um, so just pray that, that uh, it'd be clear 
and that you would speak and have your way among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Chapter 4, verse 7. A lot of love in here. It's, uh, it's hard, hard to track. Just follow close. We'll, we'll try and come back and unpack it. Um, it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, that is the appeasement or satisfaction, the payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another... God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. A lot of love. That's what defines us. Uh, John, John seems to have kind of the curve on the idea of love and the spirit. Uh, The gospel of John and the letters of John are are great resources if you're looking for a space to to process a a theology of how we should love other people. Uh, How do we break this down? It's probably important to start by recognizing the reason for which John was writing this. Uh, He was writing to a a people who were facing some heretical teaching uh, connected to the idea of Gnosticism. So you've heard of Gnosticism, which really separates spirit and material that the material is all bad and the spirit is good. And there's even ideas that, well, Jesus came in the spirit, but not in the flesh. Like he was just a a spiritual being. Um, Other people would take it the other way. He was just a person with no spiritual self, right? They were trying to, to separate those. But the problem is when you sever the idea of Jesus as fully divine, uh, you really sever the conduit through which the Spirit flows from God the Father in heaven to his people, right? We need uh, the, the person of Jesus to be fully divine to allow uh, the Spirit of God uh, to flow into his people in the world. Um, and, and these people were coming and, and basically saying that uh, Jesus was not uh, fully God's son. Uh, he was just spirit. Uh, and, and we see the importance here that, that Jesus is both. Um, because for the Christian community, for us, it's the spirit-filled Jesus who defines what love is. Right? That's the only way that happens, that he goes and, and sets the life, the life that he did, that sets that new boundary line. Uh, so we look at verse 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Uh, we pause there a little bit. This idea of being manifest among us, that's just, it's made visible among us. So, so God's love 
the being of God, was made visible in the world through the person of Jesus. Jesus is the one who manifested that. He made, it, he made an expression of God's love. So we can literally look to the person of Jesus and see how he's living, and we would see how God would want somebody to live. We see the heart of God and the person of Jesus. It was manifested in physical expression, God's love. So it's manifest among us. Uh, God sent his son into the world so that we could live, right? In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the appeasement for sin. So the purpose for which that love gets stretched way out is to bring life to a people who don't have life. It's the same for us. Within the church, the reason God calls us into a life with Christ that's way out there is so that a people who don't have life might have life. He works through us. We now are the ones who get to manifest God's love. The text says nobody has seen God. But when we love others the way Christ loved, it's expression of that. It makes it visible. Jesus is the image of God's love. Jesus shows us there is this way possible. He creates new possibility. Because before he made, he said, no, you draw here. That's the Beatitudes, right? You read them. And, and remember just a few weeks ago, I was saying, uh, Jesus points out, he's like, you have heard that it was said right here. But I tell you further, turn the cheek. Somebody smacks you. Go the extra mile. Redefines uh, marriage. Redefines adultery. Redefines everything. Just totally redefines what it is to love somebody. Jesus creates new possibility. He manifests, he makes known a form of love that the world didn't previously know. Uh, I was reading from Pelagius this week. Uh, Pelagius is probably most known for some of his goofy theology, so I I wouldn't recommend him as a a theologian, but he did have some good reasoning. Uh, Pelagius was a fourth century theologian, so he's writing way back uh, early in in the, the history of the church. But he says this, I think it illustrates really well what we're working through. He says, we distinguish three things and we arrange them in a definite order. We put in the first place possibility, what is possible. And then in the second, volition, or our will, right? What we have, desire isn't fair, what we would will to do. And in the third place, actuality, so what is real. What's possible, what we will, like we kind of know we want for ourselves. we have ability to choose that, and then what's reality, The first of these is properly ascribed to God. God establishes what is possible for all of us, for all of creation. While the other two are will, what we want of ourselves, and what we actually do are reserved for us, right? They're referred to the human agent. Therefore, man's praise lies in his willing to do a good work. Or rather, this praise belongs both to man and to God who has granted the possibility of willing and working and who by the help of his grace ever assists in the possibility. So let me break that down a little bit. The idea is there's a possibility that God has set. Jesus showed us what was possible. Before the world's line was here and they said to live out there is foolish You don't give up all your stuff when you're going to wreck your own family for the sake of somebody else. And Jesus says, oh, yes, you do. And that's actually how life comes. So he creates a new possibility. And then uh, we have our will. And for the will of the person in the flesh, the line is right here. There's no desire to live out there. Why would you live out there? Why would I have a child when it means I can't go to college anymore? Why would I have this child when it means it's going to interrupt my family? Why would I have this child if it means it's going to interrupt all my future hopes and dreams? Draw the line here. And that's where the will stops. But for the Christian who has the spirit of God, the will is awakened. The will is breathed life. And all of a sudden we have a desire, our volition 
is to live out there in a new possibility. Now, what is reality, what's actuality, that's my struggle. Sometimes I want to straddle it. But the Spirit of God is saying, and this is what, if we're in tune with the Holy Spirit, I think this is what the Spirit in His grace and His power continues to do. He starts to challenge that. He says, no, get out there. Come out with me. Peter, get out of the boat. What a good illustration. Get out of the boat, Peter. Come live by me. And he puts his eyes on Jesus, and man, he's right there. You start looking back. Israel illustrates it throughout the Old Testament. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Well, at least we had food to eat there. And God's saying, no, come out here in the wilderness. Come out here in the wilderness. And where did people fall in love with Jesus? And God, the wilderness. But you got to stay out there. But we're all facing this narrative. Get back here. That's foolish. Come, come back to, to this side, right? So Jesus redefines what's possible. Uh, we have opportunity then to, to, to mobilize it into what might be reality for us. Uh, but Jesus didn't come to prove it possible. Jesus came to invite us to live in it. And in fact, what the scriptures say is you don't even live unless you're living out there. The scriptures say to live here is not to live, It's no life because you have never tasted of this source of love that only God can give. So he's saying, until you make that leap of faith, the rich young ruler, he's he's right here. And he goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And he says, we got to follow all the rules. Yes, I'm doing that. And then he says, okay, now go cut off all that you have, right? Surrender all that you have and come follow me. And what's he do? He puts his head down and he goes back because he had great wealth. I'm not leaving that. I want that. And, And what the song that we sang is getting at is do we trust the spirit of God will satisfy us? It will. He will. Every time, he's going to fill us to satisfy us in that spot. But we have to keep pressing against uh, that, that reality. Jesus wants us to live there. First uh, John 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, it's important there we understand the definition of love. What is love? This is not love. It's not talking about that. Right? When it says, uh, verse, verse 8 here, anyone who does not love does not know God. Well, surely our atheist friends even love. Don't our, our agnostic friends, our Hindu friends, our Muslim friends, they love people, right? But it says, if you do not love, you do not know God. They don't know God. And what's getting at is, yes, they, they understand a love here that was pre-Jesus, pre-beatitudes, and and they're expressing that love. They know nothing of this love. And that's what Scripture is saying. If you don't love beyond the line of the world, you don't know God because God lives out here. And I think there's so many people in the church, the line's here, I love that guy who lives out there, but I'm not about to go out here with him because I want this right? So we have an intellectual understanding. I love that Jesus, and I love what he did for me. He came over here so that I could see over there. And we look over there, and we're like, he is a great Savior. But man, it is hard to say, let it go, so that you can live out here. And I think the spiral of the church, the decline of the church in in the world today it's, it's, it's here, and they're saying Jesus is either totally, this is totally a spiritual thing and doesn't require our physical part- participation, or it's Jesus was just some physical guy, so we don't have the spirit to empower us out there. And we've seen the cutoff right here where we get to manage what love looks like. The church isn't living out here. What led to the explosion of the church? People who lived here, sacrifice, 
right? Unique love. Totally, I mean, the, the line was hard, drawn hard in the sand, right? The clear distinction. Those people must be with the Christians because they live different. Now, is there, if we assess our church family, we're about to all scatter out into the 17 mile radius, is there difference in our lives? Or do we kind of look the same as the people down the street? That's what I'm asking myself. What am, what am I doing? And it can't be in my own strength, or there's no joy and there's no sustainability, right? But am I open to the Spirit of God saying, hey, come a little closer? And I think with maturity, as time goes on, we should be trending in this direction, right? Sometimes I see this. People are trending in this direction, but then a, a, a season in life comes, and you're like, man, I only got a little bit of time or something, and we fall way back here. Just a little more of this again. We sang this morning, teach us to number our days. The purpose of that psalm or proverb is that we would have uh, a recognition that, that life is like so fleeting. Like we think, man, I, I, just, want, I just want five more years in here. Just, I'll just have a good time in here. I'll really enjoy it. And then when I'm a little bit older, I'll surrender a little more to Jesus. It's like so quick. And it can be stolen so quick. And it's saying, just teach us to number our days. Like, it's just one day. It's, it's not, don't look at the big chunk. Just give it to him today. And when you wake up tomorrow, give it to him tomorrow. And when you wake up the next day, just one slice, right? That there's wisdom in, in numbering our days uh, that Jesus invites us in there. Uh, so what's it all mean? Uh, kind of lost my spot. Our atheist agnostic friends, they love as well. Uh, I wrote it this way, but they don't live in the place of Jesus' love, and they don't love with the purpose of Jesus' life. And that's what he's inviting us into. So we can't forget that this line is drawn really uh, by a consumeristic society that doesn't seem beyond this life and just wants the best for me and mine. But Jesus in John 4, 10 clearly says it, uh, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, right? This is not love. When I sit here and say, I love you, Jesus. Thank you for, thank you for coming to me and opening my eyes to see you, and I'll see you as soon as I die, right? This is not love. Love was Jesus coming into this mess and saying, I'm leaving all the glories of heaven behind so that you might have life. And he's saying now to us, love, love is not, hey, Jesus, love is going out into the mess and carrying the weight so that somebody around us might have life. That's love sacrificial, you know, we, I, I wrote down, we picked the fight, but Jesus took the punches, right? To love is to come alongside of somebody who is not going to give you anything in return, or, or to love somebody who gives you no benefit. They don't get you down the road socially. They don't get you down the road economically. No benefit. It's saying, I'm going to carry your garbage so that you have a chance to see the love of Christ. I don't want to do that. That's hard. And I'm with you. Like that is, there is the, the spiritual fleshly battle that's taking place. And the world's narrative, our culture's narrative is just getting louder and louder and louder. So it's harder and harder and harder to step through. That's why we say our, our kids, right? They're, they're going to be even fewer people out there. So we need to be praying for their strength, right? But it's to pay for, for our sin that Jesus went out there. We have that same opportunity uh, to love people in that radical way. Uh, if I'm honest, my sinful flesh, it fights this line all the time. All the time. I don't, I don't want to mess up what I got going as if it's pretty nice. 
don't want to interfere with my family. I don't want to interfere with the, my plans for retirement. I don't want to interfere with my evenings. I finally have a quiet evening or a quiet weekend. Man, if I'm honest, there are people that I draw this line here and I see people out there, it's like, man, to, to love that individual over an extended amount of time does not sound interesting at all because their drama is just exhausting <laughs> and their mess is too messy and I can't fix it anyways. So maybe I'll just turn and walk the other way. Maybe I'll get them next week, right? Mm. It's not the gospel. It's not the heart of Jesus. But man, it it competes for my heart. And I want to encourage us to step out there. You know, with our kids, we've been uh, on the way to school. I mentioned this in part. This isn't meant to be like humble brag. This is a a modeling of a simple way for parents to do some uh, discipleship with their kids. My kids came up with the idea, so I can't take any credit. But on the way to school, uh, we read a devotional and we talk about scripture just for five minutes, right? This week, we talked about Philippians chapter two. You should consider others better than yourselves. There's great illustrations for that for elementary kids, right? Somebody, somebody butts in front of you in line and uh, you little kids, you kids, you don't like that. That was my spot in line. Little Sammy just took it. Sammy back the line, right? But I'm telling my kids to consider others better than ourselves is to say, you know what? Go ahead. You want to you wanna go too? Go ahead. And Jesus finds his way to the back of the line with this expression of love. But man, that is hard because I don't want to be interrupted. I want to lay the line where I want to lay the line. Pelagius again. I can see where I was reading this week. Letter to Demetrius, this is titled. He says, instead of regarding the commands of our illustrious king as a privilege, instead of seeing the invitation out there as a privilege, We cry out at God in the scornful sloth of our hearts and we say, this is too hard. This is too difficult and I cannot do it. I'm only human and I'm hindered by the weakness of my flesh. He says, blind folly and presumptuous blasphemy. We ascribe to God, the God of knowledge, the guilt of twofold ignorance, ignorance of his own creation and of his own commands as if forgetting the weakness of man, his own creation, he laid upon men commands which they were unable to bear. So God is then thought of as seeking our punishment rather than our salvation. To go out there, that's terrible. I got to suffer out there? And it's salvation. No one knows the extent of our strength better than he who gave us that strength. He has not willed to command anything impossible, for he is righteous. The idea there is he's not inviting us out to do something we can't do. Let's check that. He is inviting us out to do something that we can't do in our strength. And that's the whole point. You don't step out here until you say, Jesus, help me. Lord, help me, because I can't do it. I'll do it for a week, but then I got to retreat. He's saying, no, Peter, out on the water. New life, new life. And when you step out here, it leads you into this position and posture of life that just says, Lord, help me, help me. I say, when I first started ministry, that was my biggest prayer. Like every day, Lord, help me, help me. And you've all, you've all been there in different realities. The Lord says go, or the, the world says go back there. But Jesus says, scriptures say, Holy Spirit says, just stay out here. Stay out here. It's better to be in the wilderness with Jesus than in the cities without him. It's better to be freezing cold on the front doorstep in the dead of winter with Jesus than to be in the house of luxury with him or without him. 
right? Uh, if Amos has been coming to my mind. I don't even remember when I preached through Amos, but it was like a year and a half ago, and this has just continued to hammer me. Uh, Amos, you know, when I'm saying I'm drawing the line here, uh, the, the Holy Spirit starts reminding me, forget that. That's, that's a garbage narrative, folly and blasphemy. And, and Amos, I'd encourage you to read it. What a message for our church today. Uh, it keeps coming to mind. He says, hear this, you cows of Bashan. They were big. They were well taken care of. Lots of grass to eat. Hear this, you cows of Bashan, who oppress the poor and crush the needy. Say, bring more so that we can drink. Woe to those who live in their fancy beds at night and sprawl on their couches. They eat fine meat and they drink wine. They spray their perfumes. Yet they have no grief over the ruin of Joseph. That gets me. Oh, Lord, I'll just sit here for a bit, get my nice stuff, and no grief over the state of the church. Just going down the tubes, right? So this series, this morning, uh, an invitation for us to, to go with Jesus. And if you're somebody who hasn't experienced his power and his love and his kindness, it's out there, and it can't be had from here. If, you, if you're in a spot where you're like, I've always kind of believed it, but I've not, like, it hasn't taken hold of me, you got to go out there. you gotta have, you got to learn what it means to say, this is garbage compared to out there, right? It's totally transformed, a totally new life. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop us there so we can have our communion in time. Uh, verse 13 and 16 is where I was going to wind down, and I'll just say this with it. Uh, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Uh, that one jumped out at me as to think about that, not just as a confession verbally that says at the line here, I believe it's true, but a true confession is taking the step. And if you're somebody who wants to make that confession that you believe it's true, to take that step. And as we share communion this morning, that we'd have opportunity to come forward. Now, this is the purpose of communion, that the ways we've gone astray, the ways we're drawing that line here, you know, we talk about the abortion issue, and there's some easy ways to step into the abortion issue from right here. It doesn't inconvenience us much, but we can still feel like we're participating in it. Is there something out here that God wants you to do, to participate, that requires real faith, right? And that's where he's going to meet us. And again, that, that issue is different for everybody. It's not just the abortion issue. It might be how you're treating your spouse this week. You're tired of being patient. They don't deserve your patience. You want to leave. And Jesus is saying, stay right here. You want to draw the line back here. Forget them. They treat me like garbage. Jesus said, no, get back out here. And you cling to him, all right? So as we come and share communion, I invite you uh, just to be prayerfully considering what is it that God's inviting you to make that profession of faith, that confession um, of faith. I want to uh, invite our elders forward as we share communion this morning, kind of transition our minds towards that. If you're a, a guest or visitor this morning, uh, we invite you to participate in communion with us. Uh, we believe anybody who's put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That means anybody who's stepped out here and has made that profession of faith that, that you are invited to participate. Uh, if your children have an understanding of what they're doing, uh, we invite you to share in that as family discipleship and just corporate sharing of communion. Uh, you'll be able to come up these center lines. You can take communion here, uh, or you can take it back to your seat. Uh, there are cups that you can get for the juice, or you can dip the bread into the cup. Um, there's also a station over here in the, the hub space in the fellowship hall. There should be some people up front. Uh, so you'll just be able to come forward and have a seat. Our worship team will be praying, playing as well. Um, I want to read a passage for us, set our hearts for script or for, uh, for communion. Second Corinthians chapter five. 
Um, it's a little bit longer, so I'm just inviting you to really, uh, if you need to close your eyes, you can close your eyes. Uh, I, I really feel this scripture gets right at uh, what I was talking about. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to listen to this. I'll pray for us, and uh, we'll move into a time of communion. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So from now on, church, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh, Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. So we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and in affliction and through hardship and calamities and beatings and imprisonment and riots and labors and sleepless nights and hunger through our purity and knowledge and our patience and our kindness by the Holy Spirit that is genuine love through truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors, yet we're true. We're treated as unknown, yet we are very well known. We're treated as though we're dying, and behold, we live. We're punished, but we are not killed. We're treated as sorrowful, yet we always rejoice. We're treated as though we're poor, yet we're making many others rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We've spoken freely to you. Corinthians, church, our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. So in return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Father God, as we prepare our hearts for communion, Lord, uh, I thank you for the, the hard work of uh, turning our eyes and ears towards you, of uh, having to deal with our, our, uh, our sinful temptations that tell us to stay back, uh, to not cross that line. Uh, Lord, I pray that this morning uh, there be some here, uh, my, for myself uh, first and foremost, would widen my heart and step out with you so that others may know you and see you. Lord, I pray that our church could be the manifestation of God in the world, that people would see his love on display. Lord, that what we call sacrifices would be offerings of love done in joy, done in a desire for you. God, I pray that you would strengthen people who are living in the, the hard places already. Lord, that your spirit would strengthen them and equip them. The the weapons of righteousness on the right hand and the left. Lord, for those who are being mocked, those who are facing sleepless nights, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them. 
Uh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave your life for us, that you shed your blood, died on a cross. We celebrate it this morning, and we know that uh, we are the people in the world who remember you as the one who made a new form of love even possible. So I pray, God, as, as we take communion, that we would uh, seek forgiveness in the areas we need it, Lord, that we would be encouraged that you do forgive us, that you would strengthen us. We pray it all in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen.